So again, thanks for the time. Uh, it's real simple, man. We do like 45 minutes on a podcast. Then we do about five minutes on a St. Louis seven. It goes up on YouTube. Uh, I just like having conversations with people and in the last four years, man, you've, you've done a lot in the St. Louis high school football community. So congratulations. Appreciate that, man. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's been a blessing. It's been a learning experience and, and, and a lot of, uh, positive memories so far too. What'd you have for lunch today in this cold? You get leftover Super Bowl chili or what'd you do? No, I downed all that yesterday. So <laughs> I had I had brats in a blanket for the first time and it was it was life changing. <laughs> I, I've had pigs in the blanket, but I never had a bratwurst in the blanket. But um, where'd you get the brats from? Oh uh, man, uh, my mom, she threw down on them. Uh so usually I like to watch the Super Bowl with my pops and and, and my mom and them. And so, you know, me and my wife went over there, my daughter and watched it. So um small little family event we talked to coach reed a couple of weeks ago are your guys coming in for weights now or where are you at with all this covid nonsense yeah we're we're on a slow transition to open in the weight room so right now it's going uh it was going on pretty much a year since we've had weight room access um but we're doing a, a slower transition to it trying to be uh, i guess uh as covid responsible as possible so um that's required us to um, adjust. But uh, like I told the guys, we know what we're dealing with now uh, to a certain extent. So uh, it's on us to adapt. Talked about your guys coming into the weight room. What do linemen bench nowadays? Well, um, Makai Wingo, um, that's one of our, our uh, linemen. Uh, he's benching. Um, thinking upwards of 350 pounds, um, 360, 370 in that range. Um, but as far as our standard, you know, you'd like to have a high school lineman, um, you know, hopefully hitting over 275 uh, to 300 at least. So they can do you 300 know. like five times, six times? Uh, with the rep tests, uh, you know, one of our stronger guys, you know, they're hitting probably 315 for five reps. Um, but to your standard high school athlete, that's that's such a the progression to benching that much weight uh, probably comes a lot later than when you're expected to contribute on the field, if that makes sense. So. And what were um, you repping back in the day? Huh. Oh man, uh, when I first got there, I could barely move any weight. I was about as a freshman, I was probably six feet, 140 pounds, and I could barely move any weight, but. Uh, doing a lot of push-ups and stuff on my way out. Probably hit 225 for eight reps is what I think I came into Mizzou doing. Um, but it was quite the process. Um, I had to get to work as soon as I got on campus. I couldn't spare any time. It's one of those things where, so what, I'm 50. You're a good 10 years younger than me, give or take. Mm -hmm. I was always a bigger fan of reps because then I didn't have to tell anybody how little I could actually bench. I could say, yeah. oh, I, I do 187 times. I didn't have to tell yeah. them, but I, I can't do 220. Well, you know what? With us, um, we actually prefer reps too. Um, the one rep max puts you somewhat at risk, increased risk for injury, unless you're training for that run, one rep max. But, you know, when it comes to bar speed, um, you want that, that movement, that pressing motion, to mimic uh, the pressing motion as if you had a opponent across from you. And so the issue with the one rep max test, besides the, the increased likelihood of injuries, that bar speed is usually not that fast. Um, and so uh, it doesn't mimic the explosion we need. So with the rep test, um, you're able to mimic the explosive mo uh, motion that you have when you're taking on the opponent, whether it's blocking or you know pushing somebody off of your stiff form, whatever it may be. So. Uh, we try to keep that as the emphasis, but um, I think the best part of the weight room for our guys isn't even the weights being moved, it's the relationships built, honestly. Um, you might not know each other too well coming in, but when you see a guy across from you that's working just as hard for the same thing you're working for, you come to respect them. And so, um, you know, uh, with any team dynamic, especially a team as big as a football team, uh, not everybody's going to like each other, um, but everybody's going to respect each other. And you can, you can gain a lot of respect 
just by showing up and applying yourself. And, and we try to reward those guys regardless of how much or how little the weight they move. If they're consistent and they're giving their all, I'll take it. Talked about your pops. What did he do? Um, pops, he's old Sumner Bulldog. Um, he uh, football and track there. He was a hurdler. Uh, then he went to the military right route. And so he's a, a retired military veteran. And your mom? Um, she's old Hazelwood East Spartan. Um, very, very uh, smart woman. A very hardworking woman. Um, and her and my dad have partnered together to raise six children and have 11 grandkids. And, and my mom and my dad are, are the rock of our family. Uh, a great example of love, but also a real great example of, of, of the honesty that comes with it. And so, um, you know, um, I think it's, it's awesome that we've had in my family, both of our, you know, at least in my perspective, uh, both of my role models under the same roof as me. So um, that, that's kind of awesome dynamic. Coach, what part of St. Louis did you grow up in? Um, Ferguson, Florida. So um, started out in Ferguson um, and then into my uh, elementary, latter part of elementary school um, up through high school was in Ferguson. So I was anywhere from all the way down at Coo Valley Elementary um, on to Wedgwood and Cross Keys. Um, so that's kind of, kind of where I grew up. So I'm old North County boy. Did you get any of your football cleats at, uh, sports print? Oh uh, man, we used to go to, uh, sports print, uh, Johnny Max. Um, we used to hit up all the spots, but yeah, um, whatever was on the clearance rack, that's <laughs> what, that's what I was snagging. So, um, the, the cleats they got now are way better. Uh, we didn't have positional cleats back then. It was just... <laughs> either cleats or no cleats. So <laughs> linemen and receivers seem to wear the same, but as I got to high school, uh, the cleats got a little more popular. I was able to, you know, wear my Michael Vicks. I love my Vicks. Um, and some of them, I'm a Nike guy, so I used to like rocking those too. How'd you get from Norco to Dismet? Um, Honestly, uh, uh, I had an older cousin, uh, Donald, that played at Dismet for a little bit. Um, and was able to go to some games and watch him and seeing that atmosphere and how they kind of rallied around him was pretty awesome. But uh, really for me, it was a opportunity for academics. Um, at that time, McClure North was still a really good school. It was a five-star school. And um, I wasn't necessarily a superb athlete where I felt that, that uh, I just knew I was going to go play college ball like I wanted to. But, you know, being that bean pole, you know, you're, you're young and naive. You're comparing yourself to um, NFL players. And I'm like, I'm not 6'4", and I don't have a cannon for an arm. You realize that, you know, you you can grow into that. But, um, yeah, uh, really academics was huge in my house. And so my parents, you know, they were like, well, hey, if you, if you want to go to college, um, it really was my decision. They're like, if you want to go to college, uh, you know, it doesn't hurt to surround yourself with a place that looks like it. And so just that high academic um, curriculum that the Smith had drew me in, the student body um, that they had as far as, you know, how they celebrated their students, how everybody kind of rallied behind each other. That was an atmosphere unlike I had seen before, you know, in Little League, you know, in the JFL and, and in the AAU circuit, it's usually mom and dad doing all the shouting. So it was cool to see you know, students do that, but really it was a, it was an academic move and, and uh, one that, that I'm grateful uh, that I pursued to this day. Not to say other boys schools don't do this, but my son went to the Smet, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. And one of the things, Steven, so one of the things that really impressed me back in the day, this is six years ago, the first day they get those boys on campus, by five o'clock that day, they are drinking the Kool-Aid. They are so pumped about being part of that school's culture. Was it the same for you? Do you remember back what it was like? Um, for me, yeah. I, like I say, when I saw my cousin Donald play, I, I was able to sense the pride that was there. Um, as far as drinking the Kool-Aid, uh, 
it was a very strategic move for me at that point. You know, I was just like, this is what I want out of it. This is what I'm hoping to get. But there were so many awesome things in between that took place. And, and I think the best part of it is, you know, I tell a lot of young men now that, you know, as they're, you know, deciding what school they're going to, which is, you know, um, is there's a lot of good schools in St. Louis is about finding your fit. And um, I think the Smith uh, definitely fit what I was looking for. And I think uh, the more open they are with what their mission is and what they have to offer, you attract young men that, uh, that see value in that fit. But um, they, it, I mean, uh, you know, at times. Uh, You're smiling. As, what are you thinking a, about? What story yeah. are you thinking about? Well, I would say, you know, at times, uh, you know, the Smith felt like a frat house, you know, during mission week. And I thought that was, you know, that was pretty dope. Just like they like we scheduled time to put in work, but they did a really good job of scheduling fun, you know. And so, you know, right when you're like, man, you know, th th these last few weeks have been tough. But then, oh, it's mission week or oh, it's, you know, we're going to take activity period. We're going to play bubble soccer. We're going to play hand hockey. We'll do the Sparta Olympics where home rules compete against each other. Um, you know, when I was coming up, we'll have a, a Halo competition. We'll play the video games, Mario Kart. And so they just did a really good job of scheduling fun. And so I think that's what has people drinking the Kool-Aid when they get there is, you know, you're hearing about the work you got to put in and, and all the success that comes with it. And then you realize that fun is a big part of that. And that's a big part of that feel that keeps you going. And so um, I think that's what shocks a lot of kids when they come in. It's just how fun it is um, because all you hear about is the academic challenges. Um, but uh, they do a good job of scheduling that for us. Like they have a good feel for their students. Um, and that's what I felt coming in um, because it was kind of a culture shock, but uh, when you're having fun together, you know, um, that's the only thing you're really thinking about. Trying to make you feel comfortable. I, I, I got out my stuff, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nah, you good, man. You got the arch behind you. So even more than the Smet, I love St. Louis. So we always, uh, you throw that on, I'm always good. So, Coach, you're on a really short list. How many other people in the Smet history have won a state championship as a player and then also as a coach? Uh, I think Josh Klein did, our soccer coach. Okay. Um, and so he's running a hell of a program over there. And so and he's had that luxury of doing that, uh, leading his guys, um, you know, leading them to one and playing in one. So um, that's, that's good company to keep. Growing up, were you a fan of the greatest show on turf? You were around 10, 11, give or take. Um, growing up, I was a big Raiders fan. Love Charles Woodson. Uh, mm. Was extremely excited to see him uh, get inducted to the Hall of Fame this Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, biggest regret. Like, so coming out, like when I grew up watching ball, Charles Woodson had won the Heisman. Right, like right around the age where I could understand what I was watching. Yeah, so he had just um, he had just won the Heisman, and so I'm watching him, and I'm like, well, if you want to be the best player uh, in football, you got to be like Charles. So that's what kind of got me started on wanting to be a corner. Little did I know he was the the only person, only defender to this point mm -hmm. um, to win the Heisman. But that's what got me wanting to be a corner. I was like, I want to be Charles Wilson. Um, so I used to love Michigan and he got drafted by the Raiders and, and my dad, you know, he was a diehard Raiders and, and Steelers fan. He liked the, the defenses, the hard nose, hard hitting defenses. So I grew up a Raiders fan. Um, and then actually I had the luxury of playing Charles his last year, um, in the NFL with the Raiders. And, um, I got to introduce myself to him and, and I'm like, you're the reason I play corner. Like I play offense just you know they helped the team if they felt I was of use there but I just wanted to be a corner like Charles Woodson and then uh, I met him got to tell him man you're the reason I play corner like man like all the things you did your journey you know growing up in Ohio all that and uh, the dumbest thing was I forgot to take a picture with him <laughs> uh, as we're standing there and I'm like you get to meet your hero you're wearing a similar uniform to theirs and I forgot to take a picture and so that's probably one of my my biggest regrets um, in my playing career was not getting a, a photo with my, my idol, Charles Woodson. 
I guess I wasn't paying attention, but I was surprised Calvin Johnson was a first year eligible inductee. Yeah, I think when you look at Calvin's overall numbers, um, it might not be the top tier because he didn't have longevity in his career. But what you were able, the sample size he gave us and what his nine, 10 years in the league, um, probably one of the most impressive runs you could have. And so I think sometimes just because you have the most numbers, uh, or the highest numbers, doesn't necessarily mean that's a direct reflection of your impact. You know, he's probably, I think he's only two players have had more 200 yard receiving games than him. He's led the NFL. He has the record for most receiving yards in the season, you know, and so um, I get it. He was a force, and you take into account the lack of help or uh, receivers he had, a rushing game to divert people away from him. Um, I mean, he's a stud. We played him in the playoffs, and the whole game plan was around him wherever he lined up. And so uh, and he's massive, by the way. Um, but he earned that name Megatron, and I, <laughs> I wasn't as surprised to see him get in. So you graduate from DeSmet. How come Mizzou? By the way, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> shit, there was a lot of people that had to, <laughs> that made Mizzou awesome. But I would say um, I really wasn't thinking Mizzou. Like I said, I, was, I really like Michigan, uh, Iowa, places like that. But um, I'm the youngest of six. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, my dad, you know, he, he, had heart, he has heart disease. And so traveling is tough on him and so um he he didn't really care where I went he was like don't pick because of me but um you know I I just kind of I went into Mizzou didn't have that high expectations you know because the whispers of St. Louis at that time and um went on a visit and it was amazing um the the staff the strength coach coach Ivy was one of the best still is Mm -hmm. um and had Blaine and, and uh, come in there and, and, and Wesley ended up joining in too. And it just was like, it's close to home. I'm far enough away from home to be away, but I'm close enough to, if I forget something, I can drive back. My whole family can partake in it. You know, See, when I went to Mizzou, it was far enough away, but close enough that I could drop my laundry off. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I wasn't getting no damn laundry done, but I could go pick up a plate. Uh, we had kind of a, a, like my mom, she can throw down. So it's so a lot of teammates trying to come through for Thanksgiving and 4th of July. And, I, and so they start jockeying a few weeks in advance. But uh, I was like, hey, I got to have some for me, too. So I'm only taking like three of y'all. What was your mom's go to dish? Uh, man, uh, the peach cobbler everybody was in love with. Mm-hmm. Um, she probably makes some of the, uh, the best peach cobbler you can ask for. But she can cook everything she can make. Um, I mean, she can make a uh, broccoli taste like a steak. Like she just knows what flavors to add. Uh, she knows how to experiment. Um, and that's actually one of my favorite things to do is just cook. It's kind of therapeutic. Something that I definitely try to do as much as I can in the off season. Um, well, we know we've got the brats in a, in a, in a blanket. What's yeah. your go-to outside of that? And um, by the way, if you have not had the brats and pretzel buns, from Gus's pretzels, you gotta yeah. you gotta check that out. Man, you're trying to turn me into a linebacker. <laughs> uh, that that sound on point. Um, uh, for me, overnight French toast. I, I'm a big breakfast guy, so right. um, just taking you know you can take uh, any type of bread, whether it's Texas toast or um, French bread or whatever. Let that sit overnight. Pecan praline topping. Um, then you bake it in the oven. Um, and it's on point. It's a lot of other things. Like initially I discovered the recipe and I took it to my mom and, and she kicked it up a notch and was like, here, add this, put that in it. So uh, my dad, he was a, he was a little league coach and as, as creative as he was with the playbook, uh, that's how creative my mom was with the cookbook. So um, she knew how to throw it together real well. But, you a corned beef hash guy? Um, Pops is, you know, he liked to throw it with the, um, you know, mix it with the hash browns and stuff. There was a spot in Minnesota, Al's Diner. It was probably like the oldest restaurant, one of the oldest ones in Minneapolis, but they make a real good corned beef hash and they make a bacon waffle, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a waffle with chunks of bacon cooked into it. And I used to, anytime I go there, that's what I throw down on. Now, down in Columbia, you had hit Broadway Diner. 
Uh, for me, I, I used to hit Broadway Diner, but everybody knew about it. So, you know, you try to go to Broadway Diner on a Sunday after a game, everybody who was an alum is there. Um, so I used to go to um, Jimmy's Steakhouse. And then uh, um, it wasn't until after I got out of high school and had a job, uh, <laughs> I could actually afford to go to Mary's, which was really good, too. Ooh, that was fancy. Yeah, I, um, I felt real fancy when I walked in and saw Coach Pinkle sitting there, too. I was like, all right the stipends you couldn't even think about going to mary's when you was a student <laughs> i think i went there like twice on somebody else's dime by the way yeah. broadway diner coach that's not sunday morning that's saturday at three o'clock in the morning well shit i'm playing or i'm recovering we got workouts in the morning you know we have them sunday meetings but didn't they have the uh the slinger or whatever they used to have there absolutely so do you remember where you had your first slinger um i'm pretty sure wasn't it there i think broadway diner has it right, the, right. Uh, i got my car towed the same day um uh, with the night before oh, I, uh, no, I i gotta ask you about that well it just was <laughs> parking tickets yeah you know como <laughs> so we parked my car uh somewhere and i thought like i know i didn't have that much fun the night before so i'm like <laughs> why is my car not here um and so found out it got towed it was just like well the Here's the diner right here. So it ain't going nowhere. So I was like, might as well just go uh, drown my sorrows in a slinger. But that was the first time I had one there. You still um, buddies with Wes Kemp? Talk oh, yeah. That's, Wes is one of my uh, one of my best friends. Um, he's you know, one of the nicest people I've ever met. I wouldn't say all that, but he's a good <laughs> dude. He's a good dude, though. Um, but yeah, Wesley was a groomsman at my wedding, um, you know, Actually, interestingly enough, like we met each other at the Smet and he already had a beard and he was six four and I was this old scrawny kid. But I remember any example we did at the Smet, uh, like it was incoming freshman camp, all the kids knew who Wesley was. Like if there was an eighth grade rivals, he would have been a five star on it. And so um, initially when I met him, I was like, well, he was a receiver and I was a corner. I can't wait to match up with this dude. And, and we used to compete hard as hell against each other. And as I saw him work and as he saw me work, we really just started to develop a bond with each other to where we weren't really competing against each other, we were competing for each other and pushing each other. And, and he's one of the hardest working guys that I know. Um, he's a guy that's committed to his own growth. Wesley loves to read. He'll pass good books my way. Um, I would say his only flaw is uh he came in front of uh robert stiebel no it's thinking <laughs> draymond green is a first ballot hall of famer <laughs> and so that's probably his biggest flaw and so um uh, we've been debating that for quite some time but no we used to play each other in AAU all the time he's a basketball player but he's a he's a great man and, and a reliable friend and, and somebody that's that's pushed me um he actually got his shot at the league a year before i did because he didn't red shirt and uh, I remember he did some time in the league. Um, and after his first year, he came to watch me at Memphis. I was a graduate transfer. And he watched my game. And uh, after the game, uh, he told me, you know, you did solid. But he said, quite honestly, your play didn't look desperate enough. It was like you didn't look hungry enough on the field. Um, he said, and in the league, he said, if I can see it, I know the league can see it. And he just kind of ran me through, like, if, if you want to play at the next level, these are the things you got to do. And, and for a friend, because I'm actually a little older than Wesley, but for a friend to pull me to the side and just be as honest as possible with me with mm -hmm. based off his own experience, um, I, I couldn't help but respect that. And to pull me to the side, know me well enough and, and care about me enough to shoot me straight. And I think that was a pivotal point in my career um, as a player. Um, but I think he's a testament of the impact a friend can have on you when they know you and they truly do care about you. And so I, I will say he's one of the best friends you could have uh, for sure. All right, coach. Um, first of all, having a ball, we're going to do another 20 minutes or so. Then we're going to do a St. Louis seven. Going to talk a lot about the Smet and the miracles you have pulled <laughs> at North Ballast, by the way. Yes, we'll get into this. You're the first person I've ever talked to who was a participant of the Oklahoma-Missouri game in, what was it, 2010? Mm -hmm. First of all, again, this is my second thank you 
one of my five most enjoyable <laughs> Missouri moments. I got there on game day. We got there at 7 38 o'clock. We were there for game day. We were there for the game. Um, funny stories off the record in regards to how much fun we had that day. Did you get on the field that day? Yeah. Um, so I played corner that game. So I rotate in at corner, but actually, um, like I say, Wesley was my best, one of my best friends, my best man, John McGaffey. Um, the kickoff return. Yeah, he's the one that ran the kickoff back, and and I was able to be out there blocking for him on that. But uh, John's infamous for that return. Um, I think John's probably one of the best players that uh, McGaffey, probably one of the best players at Mizzou, never really got to see everything he could do because um, he was a heck of a player. I mean, that was his only kick return. And he he has great vision. He ran it back for a touchdown. But yeah, that was that was my guy, man. I remember um, after he ran that back. I'm also on kickoff team too because I was a sophomore, so I was on the kickoff return. Right. Um, I'm pretty sure I missed my block, and so the only reason I hustled my ass down there to block for John was because I had to make <laughs> up for it. Um, but I had to go and do the kickoff right after that, and. I, I pretty much like almost threw up in my mouth on the sideline. <laughs> and I just, we just told the kicker, we were like, man, put that thing out the back of the end zone. And I'm pretty sure I didn't make it across the 50 yard line on the kickoff. Cause I was like adrenaline rush pumped up, you know? Um, but yeah, that was an exciting moment for John and, and probably the best college football atmosphere I've ever been a part of. Um, Where did we so. go and celebrate after that game? Man, so crazy enough, um, my roommate was Trey Hobson, uh, was a fellow cornerback of mine. And unfortunately, um, his cousin, who was in attendance, was pretty much like his brother, uh, had, had his life uh, senselessly taken. He was murdered the night before at a oh. gas station, unfortunately. And uh, so me and Trey were sharing the room together. So we had police officers coming in and out of the room all night. Um, you know, just talking to Trey, letting them know the details and, you know, so you console and Trey and uh, the night before so, the game, because mm -hmm, we stayed oh. at a hotel the night before. And right. so Trey was up all night um, and as was I with him. And, um, you know, he had family in and out. Well, the game was a nighttime game. So right. uh, we had the whole day, but we have meetings throughout the whole day. So we played that night game. And due to lack of sleep, I said, I'm going to take a quick nap um, after the game, after we won. They rushed the field, all that. I said, I'm going to take a quick nap, and then I'm going to go hit the streets. And so I just laid my head down around 11, plan on taking a power nap and going out at midnight. And I laid my head down, and then I woke up ready to party and looked at my clock, and it was 6 o'clock. <laughs> so <laughs> I missed the whole celebration, but I saw him cutting the post down and all that stuff, so. It well, if it's any consolation, my story was Tigers win, and we've got transportation from a friend of our friend who lives in Columbia, right? Mm -hmm. They come pick us up at the game after the game's over. He's had his power nap, and he's like, come on, let's go to Columbia. We're going to have some fun. And I looked at my friend, and I said, there's no way this story gets better after 11 o'clock. <laughs> Yes. I'm yes. going to get worse. So yes. Go home, watch ESPN, and enjoy the highlights. Yes. Well, our story didn't get uh, it didn't get better the following week. I think we went to either Texas Tech or Nebraska and, and right. got smacked uh, the next couple of games. But no, that was that was epic. I mean, I think Mizzou can get back to that point. Obviously, as as COVID restrictions go away, but. Um, I well, mean, I that's that's why I went to, to Mizzou. More and more dismet recruits. That would help. Yeah, I mean, we got some some quality young men here. They're on the right path uh, with the guys they're going after. They got some offers extended um, to some up and coming guys. But uh, I remember you asked me why Mizzou. Um, I mean, I wanted the standard college experience. Like I like one of my favorite movies I used to watch with my sister was Old School. You know, with mm. Will Ferrell, and I was just like, we're gonna I, streak I, in the park. Not at all, but at the same time, <laughs> I wanted that 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 just that standard college experience that not another team movie college experience, the big campus. You can meet somebody new every day. Um, I did the private school route, and so I was like, let's do it. And so 
that game was kind of a reflection of that. Like I just wanted to to just be in a, a bubble with other 18 to 20 some year olds and and just enjoy each other a little, maybe a little too careless at times, right? But um, it, it was a healthy level of recklessness, uh, I assume because I, I'm still alive now. So um, <laughs> I got everything I wanted out of that experience uh, from a student perspective. So coach, you leave Mizzou, you go to Memphis, you spend a year there, you hone your craft. We've had Steve Savard on, anchor over at Channel 4, and he, like you, got a taste. I mean, there's so few people who make it to that level. Now, you didn't spend 10 years in the league. You didn't win a couple rings, but but you got there. You achieved something. And one of the things Steve talked about to me was he did not anticipate how cutthroat it was. I mean, yeah. just how everybody wants your job. You're trying to get their job, and he didn't see that coming. Yeah, a couple of things. Like, I remember coming in as a rookie, um, and I had to share a room with somebody in my position group, uh, the same position as me, and I remember uh, his alarm would go off. Like, I, I do a pretty good job of waking up without an alarm. Um, so I just was kind of laying there and his alarm went off and, uh, every day I would see him, uh, try to sneak out the room and not wake me up and tell me if we had a meeting or not, because <laughs> he was gunning for the same spot I was gunning for. And I was just watching, but, um, I remember when I was with the Vikings, my rookie year, we had, um, there was a teammate of mine. We had just practiced and we came in the locker room and I think it was, uh, Brian Robeson, the DN. Uh, he came up to uh, another defensive lineman and told him, man, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about the news. Uh, I, think his, I think his name was George. He was like, I'm sorry about the news, George. And uh, it's like, what are you talking about? And, and Robeson's like, you don't know? And he's like, yeah, like, are y'all joking with me? And then Robeson pulls up his phone and on Twitter, it, it showed the guy that he had been cut. Mm. Um, and Twitter knew he was cut before he did. And they waited to cut him during practice so they could get one more practice out of him before they brought somebody else in. Wow. And that kind of... Welcome to the Shield. Yeah, that kind of sobered me up. But then I just realized, man, I've, I've had teammates that did amazing and got cut. I've had guys that have underperformed and got kept. And so I just realized everything I'm going to do in this league, I'm going to do so I sleep easy at night. I'm just going to put my all into it. And if they cut me, that's their decision to make. And if they keep me, um, you know, I'm grateful for it. I was fortunate not to have to go through that carousel too many times in my three years, but um, uh, got to work with some great men like Leslie Frazier um, and, and Mike Prefer and Joe Woods and people like that. And so, um, you know, and even going to Dallas, it was good people, but it, you, it's all in what your focus is on. You know, it's cutthroat going in. It's a great opportunity. And, um just appreciate it for what it's worth and, and, and thank God for it. That was my quickest prayer every day before practice is say, appreciate it, Jesus. And we go about it, man. So I don't know the answer to this question. Were you and EJ Gaines tight? Uh, yeah, we had a pretty positive relationship. EJ was uh, very tough. He was a running Because you were back. older than him. Did you help yeah. him kind of find his way? Uh, man, we was all helping ourselves at that point. Um, mm -hmm. uh we didn't have a ton of instruction in our position room. It really was just an emphasis on being physical, not as much fundamental emphasis. But one thing EJ had was uh, he was extremely instinctive and he was tough because he played running back in high school. And so, you know, he had a nose for the ball. Um, when he got there, he made it count. Um, I think the only thing that's holding him up now is just staying healthy. Right. Um, I thought he'd be for sure first or second round draft pick um, a couple of years after I left. But um, I think injuries caught up with him, but he still had a, a productive career. And I think EJ was extremely talented, probably one of the best corners Mizzou's had. So you're in the NFL, finding your way, trying to find a spot. How do you end up at the SMET? Man, um, I, I was substitute teaching in my off seasons. So um, when I when I first started playing, uh, obviously you want to give back to your community, right? 
And so um, I remember uh, after my rookie year, um, the, uh, the murder of Mike Brown happened. And mm. I remember seeing like just the, uh, you know, obviously you saw the frustration, um, you saw the, you saw some unity, but you also saw a lot of confusion. And a lot of that confusion was amongst our youth. Um, you know, I, I followed on, you know, Twitter or Facebook at the time, kids that went to the Smet uh, that, that had played, that were playing there. And you could just see them asking a lot of questions. And so I was started thinking about how could I get involved? Cause you know, having, you know, grown up in the Ferguson, Florissant area, a lot, of, a lot of those kids are me, you know, and so I say, how can I get involved? And so the first thing they always say is football camps, right? Um, you can do football camps. Well, I think that, you know, that landscape is pretty well occupied by the St. Louis talent. We got more than enough football camps. And so I was like, how can I get in the trenches and get involved with our youth? Um, and not just youth that care about football, but just young men and young women. And so, um, uh, actually, John McGaffey, he was teaching at the time. He was like, have you thought about substitute teaching? Um, you can get in the buildings. You can meet with these kids. Um, you can help them. Uh, and, and what I ended up finding out is they ended up helping me, too, a lot. And so I got my substitute teaching license. Um, and so in my off seasons, instead of doing youth camps, um, I would go teach at different schools. Um, and that got me a chance to just really get to know our youth. I did a lot of work at the middle school and high school level. Um, and I, I just remember seeing that these kids are exposed to a lot more than I anticipated, more than I probably had exposure to at their age. But also, they're like still to the bad stuff. Well, just news, media, information, whatever they want to make of it. On their you phone. know, yeah, uh, phones, computers, all that. Right. Um, but also saw that they're still inherently good and innocent and, and their growth can happen so quick. So substitute teaching was awesome. Uh, I remember going in there and I remember a kid coming up to me and saying, hey, I recognize you. And so, um, you know, I'm, you know, you know, you're trying to have that, that fake humble smile on, you know, um, <laughs> trying to be all humble about it. Like I probably knows you from Madden or he saw me in the game. And then he shows me a picture of a SoundCloud rapper that probably had like uh, 600 followers and so I realized all right hey, you're not that big time anyway so it's probably best that you did substitute teaching and not a youth camp <laughs> but um, it was worthwhile but that's what really got me in the in the teaching and then um, did you have a class were you like a history teacher were you I did all subjects so the way it works is you know they call you and then you develop a relationship with that school uh, and, and people in that district and so they'll kind of have their preferred subs that they call on and so um, for me, I would try to, in high school, I would try to stick to business and stuff like that. Um, and at the elementary level, you know, it was PE and things like that. So, I mean, at the uh, middle school level, uh, it was PE. But that um, opened me to the idea of coaching and teaching. Uh, I used to help out at the cement in the off seasons, um, mm -hmm. you know, during the off seasons. And so that was kind of what I would do is I would train for football, you know, substitute teaching and help, uh, help the school. Um, and also taught flag football at elite uh, football academy. And that kind of opened me up, but I was going into my fourth year. Um, and uh, they always talk about that white rabbit. Um, I remember it was Leroy Glover when we were rookies, talked to us about the white rabbit. Um, and he would say, that's going to come a point you're going to be on the field. You're going to be doing something with football and it's going to tap you on the shoulder. That little white rabbit's going to tap you on the shoulder and say, are you sure you want to do this? You want to do this anymore? And so for me, my knees, uh, they had been bothering me for some, I had tendonitis in both. And the best thing I could do was rest. Like I couldn't afford the Kobe Bryant plasma shots. Um, Cause I had a similar <laughs> degenerative knee situation as him. And so um, I was supposed to go sign, I was supposed to go sign with the Falcons. And um, I, I woke up, supposed to fly up there. And I was like, I don't feel like doing it. And uh, um, my agent called me and uh, he was like, hey, you know, what's up? You want to go to that workout? I was like, I don't want to. And then I realized, well, I don't have to, you know, uh, but if I'm not doing that, I better do something. Well, and around here's what I love about your story. I didn't mean to interrupt, but I love about sports. I love about your story. We are going to talk about the Smet. Here's what I 
really think the world keeps spinning and finds its place. The Smets been not good. No disrespect to people who preceded you, but right before they were losing by tons. Mm -hmm. You don't have any head coaching experience, but you went to school there. It's like the perfect combination of if they were at least mediocre, they might not have called you. If you had five years worth of experience, you would not have returned their call. But at that point in time, it was the perfect combination. Yeah, I mean, what happened was Coach Mahoney, who had coached me, he, um, in the previous years at the Smet, he had told me that um, there was an opportunity uh, to play. I mean, the coach there, uh, he was mm -hmm. thinking about stepping down, and he said I should put my name in the hat. Um, and so I think when he told me that I caught myself when I was sub and I would have those free periods, um, I caught myself writing down more coaching philosophy than I was, um, workouts for myself in the NFL and, and the way my life has worked, God has always led me through my passion. And so I think when the Falcons and I was supposed to go do that work with them, um, my passion was like, it wasn't that I didn't want to play in the NFL is that I wanted to build in my community more. Um, having bounced around from different teams, you know, four teams in three years and, and going into my fourth team, it was like, I meet these young men or these young women at these hospitals, at these school facilities, and then I get traded or I get cut. And that relationship is also cut, you know? And like, I'm not coming back to, to Dallas. You know, I'm not coming back to Minneapolis enough to where I can foster a relationship. And so I just wanted a place where I could have a consistent investment. And I think it wasn't that I was fed up with the NFL. Obviously, my body was at a certain point where it needed a break. But it was like I was more excited about the idea of being able to invest in my community than I was to play because I knew that was what was next. I didn't plan on coaching initially, but I knew um, – based off my passion and then I look back at my journey and it was just like man this is what I want to do I mean usually that's you know that's how it works and so you know I, I dove in you know I dove in but that's always been I mean God's been good to me I would say like even with my Memphis transfer um I only you know you say why Mizzou I only had three scholarships coming out of high school I wasn't some you know what were the other Addie. two? Uh, it was uh, Wake Forest and it was Ole Miss. And uh, actually there was a fourth, it was Northwestern, but Wake Forest and Ole Miss. And so I remember uh, I, I kind of had an idea I was going to transfer. Um, uh, this is the first year the graduate transfer thing I was going to say that's before everybody transferred, graduate transfer. And nobody, nobody promoted it either. But I remember, um, you know, I knew it was like – I remember thinking like I knew I had the ability to play at the next level. Like some of my teammates had called me and said that, you know, like NFL teams were asking about me, but I was still kind of a rotational piece at Mizzou, more of a nickel than a corner. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't have the greatest relationship with my position coach. Um, but I remember there's a lot of things that my dad had to answer to with me, you know, like dad, why did you end up in this situation? Why did this work? Why didn't this? And I knew that at some point, my kids are, are the eventually the players that I coach would also have questions for me. And if my kid, if my daughter, or my son or my players ask me like, hey, dad or hey, coach, why didn't you make it to the NFL? And my best answer was, well, uh, I don't think my position coach liked me. I said, that, that's not a legacy I want to carry. That's not something you. that I want to set up. And so I, I thought about going to Memphis and now I'd, I actually was looking at like pitting these different schools. And so I remember one day I just said like a prayer. I was like, God, you know, whatever you got for me, I'm just going to trust it. You know, I'm going to stop trying to force the issue. And um, uh, I got a message. Um, I, I've been tight relationship with Barry Odom. We were already tight and he had just left Mizzou to go be the D coordinator at Memphis. And um, I knew Odom was there. Um, and so um I reached out to that school saying I was transferring. And uh, I remember uh, there was some other coaches on that staff um, that I would be working with. And so, like I said, I only had really three offers coming out. It was Mizzou, it was Ole Miss, 
as Wake Forest. Will Odom, who had played a role my time at Mizzou, he was at Memphis now. Um, Tim Billings, who was the head recruiter for me at Wake Forest, was now the D-line coach um, at Memphis. And then Chris Vine, who was the cornerbacks coach at Ole Miss, my third offer, was now the cornerbacks coach at Memphis. And so I was like, if that's not a sign. And then lastly, Memphis was a Adidas or Reebok school, and I'm a Nike dude. So I was like, fuck, them uniforms are ugly. And so um, I went on to the, uh, the Memphis website, and the first article across the top is, is, is Memphis is switching to Nike. And I was like, if that's not a sign, um, I said, I got to go jump on it. And it was scary and it was uncertainty, but I knew I needed a second opinion. I knew I would have to answer to whatever came from it. And you know what, if somebody, if I hadn't made it to the league, I could sleep easy at night knowing like, hey, you know, Steve, why didn't you make it? I could have said, well, you know, I gave it a second try and I gave it a second opinion and it just wasn't in the cards. But you I got to come home to the mothership. Yeah. So, <laughs> so when the sweat what, calls, you're 26 years old, correct? 25. 25. Are you married at that time? No, sir. All right. So it's kind of hard to get the ladies excited about marrying a high school football coach who makes not a lot of money. How'd that work out for you? Um, well, I met uh, my future wife my uh, rookie year. And so... Um, you know, she was somebody that made, made me a lot better. Uh, she has such a good heart. Um, you know, there's things I dealt with in my life that have, have hardened me, and made me a little more closed off, but there's something about being next to somebody with a warm heart that can open you up. And so um, I always knew that, you know, from the moment I met her, it really hasn't been a day that we haven't talked uh, to each other. So I kind of knew uh, that, that she was the one for me. She was my better half. And so, um, when I took the job, I mean, she was ecstatic. She was crying. She don't even know anything about the cement. She's not even from here. Um, but she was just so happy for me. She believed in me. Um, and even during those lean years, she was the one keeping me encouraged. And, um, and it wasn't just like, this is a nice thing to say. It was, I mean, she truly believed in me. And so, um, I didn't have to do much courting because I kind of knew I wrote, I wrote our wedding vows probably, um, a, a year or two after we met, um, we got married after five years, but, um, I even spelled wedding vows wrong. Cause I tried to find the email for our wedding when we actually did our vows. And right. I spelt it like, uh, the letter vows, the, uh, V O W E L S. So, uh, so I spelled you it like wrote vowels. Her vows to you. No, I wrote my vows to her, but it was cause I, like her vows could be, you're the greatest person I've ever met. I'm so happy that I've no. seen you. <laughs> no, no, I, I, that's far from it. She's very, very blunt with me, but I, I knew. So it wasn't, it wasn't a hard sell, but I think it was just exciting to be, you know, we had been together while I was bouncing around. So it was like, it's nice to just be here together, um, you know, in one town together. And I think that played a huge role in my foundation and, and even in me taking that leap because so many people were telling me, you, you know, you're crazy for leaving the NFL. Like once you leave this opportunity, you can't come back, right? And um, it was like, uh, you know, she 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 straight told me like, um, I, I think you can do it. Uh, I'm ready for it, and so it was awesome. But like once I left, I couldn't come back. I remember uh, that was uh, who was that? Uh, uh, well, I say that story for later. Anyways, <laughs> you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. All right. So yeah. you take the dismatch up, coach. I'm not a big stats guy. I'm not a big mm -hmm. Hey, let's remember this game guy. Here's what blew my mind. So what we talked yesterday and you were saying, Hey, you want to do round three with the weather? I was like, yeah, absolutely. Three. When you took the job, no disrespect to predecessors, the defense was giving up on average more than 50 points a game. Yeah. 52. 52. Last year you won the championship. My numbers are wrong. I apologize. Less than 10, less than nine. Yeah, less than nine last year. When you come um, walking into the situation, do you even look at game film or you just say, that's not what I'm going to be concerned about? 50 is such an astronomical number. It's a waste of my time to look at the film. Let's just get to work. 
Yeah, I mean, for me, um, in my career, I've been the bench warmer and the stud. So I know what it's like to have a conditional relationship with your coach. And so what I what I didn't want to do was was come in and second guess these kids. I wanted to be somebody they believed in. Um, you know, at Memphis, I had a coach that really believed in me. And, and that's what I think pushed me, uh, you know, in my career. And so I know the impact that can have. So the first thing I did was watch film and I wanted to find things that I believed in with each kid. Um, you know, a lot of coaches come in and talk about the players that it, they inherit. Um, but what I've learned is, yes, there was reasons. Uh, uh, there was issues with the players. There was issues with the coaching um, that all played a role um, into why they were struggling. Um, but at the same time, they were still out there trying. And I think as a coach, it's my responsibility to respect that and, and show a certain level of gratitude for that. So I put the film on. Uh, I think the first thing I noticed, because um, John McGaffey started out with me, it's one of the first things he noticed too. He said the receivers don't block for their running backs. Mm, they only gotcha. hustle when the ball's coming their way. Mm -hmm. And so they let me know, well, we got to get these guys caring about each other, you know, and um, – I couldn't really come in and just act like just because I played in the league that I had instant credibility. I had to get to know them, and it takes time. But I think the best thing, um, two best things I did coming in as a coach was, first off, I realized before I took the job that um, I didn't get this job because I know everything about football. I'm not the brain trust on football. And I told my players that. I said, I don't know everything. What I know, I know. And what I don't know, I'll find somebody that does, and I'll try to learn myself. But uh, the other thing was invest in those first year players as best I could, because when you pour into them, I mean, you know, even the the hardest kids and, and some of the most knuckleheads, knuckleheaded kids you had to see those guys come back and tell the younger groups, hey, man, listen to coach. There's no use in being divided. Um, you know, um, a big thing for them early on was, you know, why I'm pushing you to be great. Why are you pushing back? You know, and so. Um, but important into those first couple of years, those groups and, and the respect that they have for the program to come back and tell the younger groups like, buy in, listen, you know, don't do what I did here, but this does work here. And so um, having buy in from alumni really helped our young men move forward. And then they accepted their ownership and their own success. Well, here's it a quote that resonated with me. This is you. I want our kids to feel like our coaches are the 12th man. We are as much in the trenches as possible. Yeah. That's, um, that's, that's going to get you people walking through walls. Yeah. I think um, when I got there, like I said, I was just somebody they kind of heard about telling them to run through a wall. And, and, and as we really got rolling, uh, it was like, hey, coach, we'll meet you on the other side. It was no question. We're going through it. But um for me, you know, my work ethic had to be transparent. Um, I'm a pretty uh, mild mannered, closed off person, but for those kids, it was like, man, I gotta love up on them, and you can't fake that. Um, you gotta care. But I think uh, being in the trenches means whatever, whatever the coaching equivalent is of the work they're putting in. At minimum, we must meet them at it. So, if like I can't go run through a 230 pound running back. I can't go jump over a person and make a touchdown, right? I can't kick a game winning field goal, but I know the work that goes into it. I know the heart that goes into it. And it's my job as a coach to meet them at that level at mm -hmm. minimum. And so um, if that means, you know, putting extra work into some, you know, you know, the extra hours of film, how we present stuff to them, um, the organization of the practice schedule, whatever, it needs to look like so they know like, hey, he's putting in work too. And, and I think that's how we fed off each other as a 12th man was like, I was able to take the work that they were putting in and bottle it up and, and, and make that um, something of value from a coaching perspective. And what they were able to do, um, they were aware of some of the things that were being thrown at me and uh, they were able to take that and um, bottle that up and make it something of value from a player's perspective. And so, you know, we just kind of went back and forth doing that. Um, and, and that's how you kind of created that 12th man. And we got a lot of great men on our coaching staff that are doing that. Uh, even the late coach, Jazz Granderson, I mean, before his, you know, his passing and his murder, um, he had totaled his car. 
And, um, and, you know, I told him, take a break. You know, you can't get to practice, you know, that's fine. Instead, he was Ubering to practice, catching rides with players to practice. Um, and the players saw that. It takes a certain level of humility to you know, be catching a ride with a high school kid or, or, or to be using an Uber, getting dropped off all the time in a different car. But the kids saw that and they said, this guy is trying to get to practice by any means. And so if he can show up, I can too. And so I think that played a really big role and, um, and being that 12th man was just meeting their work at the coaching equivalent level of it. You know, and, um, coach, we're going to end on a high note, but I want to follow up on that. Right. So yeah. CBC just met on freaking ESPN might be a signature win for your program. I don't pay enough attention, but it was a big deal. And then if my math's right, it's about a month later that the coach got killed. Is that correct? Yes, sir. The, oh, no, no, no. Um, the He got murdered um, the week of our Hazelwood Central game the year before, two years prior. So oh, good. It was, it was the one in nine year, um, the week we played Hazelwood Central. Uh, we actually okay. ended up losing. But that was the week he got uh, he had lost his life and we had his funeral. So the question, thank you. The question is after the CBC win on ESPN, right? Do you bring that back in the fold and try to teach these young men the importance of what they're doing on the field, but the importance of what life is long term? You know what? I think uh, we started to bridge that gap well before that ESPN game. Um, I remember after the at the jazz, the, the week of jazz is passing and murder, and we played that football game. There was a lot of kids crying because they felt like they had let him down. And, you know, I just told him, you don't honor him with the win, you honor him with your effort. And I remember the the young men kind of trying to embody that. Like some guys got tattoos, all this stuff, but it was just they wanted to honor him with their effort. And me likewise. And so the, the most telling moment was, you know, after he passed and I had to address them um, in the weight room and it's very tearful. And we go, we, they say, hey, if you got any questions, you need any answers, go to the chapel. Um, and so they're like, we'll have people there, professionals that can meet with you guys. You know, these are 14, 15 year old kids trying to deal with sure. murder, especially in the time where most of the time we spend more time trying to justify death instead of mourning it. And so, um, I talked to the school leadership and then I stopped by my office before I headed to the chapel uh, where the kids are supposed to get their answers. And I go in my office and there's about 15, 20 kids sitting in my little office um, looking at me saying, coach, we need an answer. And at that moment, it really hit me what a coach is and, and, and it's about life. And I'm not saying that I was not the professional, you know, I was not the chaplain that could, could give them all the answers but I realized I was one of the people that they looked to. And so that just, it's unfortunate that took place, but that really just put things into perspective for us. And from there, I mean, we started to just, just get our life, you know, just seeing the crossover light, like we talked to Mad Men stuff and all that, but everybody says it, football's a microcosm of life, right? And so um, we said we had to model that. And before we could have, as you would say, a, a pivotal win like the ESPN game, we had to suffer some pivotal losses. And um, we realized a big deciding factor was trust, uh, trust in your preparation, trust in those around you. And um, it just was able to go national on the ESPN game, but it was a moment that our kids were ready for. Um, you know, their whole journey had got them ready for it uh, the whole time. And so um, I always say uh, my favorite story is David and Goliath from the Bible. Um, but it's not because David slayed a giant is what he did before it. Um, he looked back on a lot of things that he had been through, um, you, know, you know, chasing the lions, taking on the Philistines, all these different battles that he had, had that God took him through. And by the time he was done looking back and he looked forward at that giant, it didn't seem so giant. And I think uh, that journey, you know, not everything was necessary, but that journey gave us strength. And I think it created a bond and a foundation that you know will be hard to duplicate um in some parts of it you hope to never have to deal with again but um 
I think that's what really set us up for that ESPN game. 2020 All-American Coach of the Year. Yeah, um, that was one. Uh, you know, I, I wanted my players to see my, themselves in it. I wanted the DeSmet community to see themselves in it. Um, somewhat of an awkward award to accept um, just because in, in football, um, there's so many role players and what it takes to be successful. Mm -hmm. And so I just didn't want that uh, perceived individual accolade to not give recognition to everybody that played a role. And like I say, the community, the players, my coaching staff that sacrifices so much, the parents um, and, and the players. Like I said, I really want them to see themselves in it. But I think Jordan Johnson said it best. That is, um, you know, he kind of, you know, you know, these kids, they got some wisdom, too. And he told me um, at his All-American acceptance speech, he looked over at me and he said, Coach, um, he said, uh, I know you don't like to give yourself credit, he said, but sometimes, you know, you just need to, to shut up and take it all in. <laughs> and um, that's what I did. Once I saw the player celebration, um, you know, when, when I won it and I saw the community, I was like, all right, this is our award. Um, this is a reflection of what we do. And uh that made it a lot easier um, to live with. And then, you know, everybody's going to want to come beat you after that. So that's <laughs> something that, uh, that's a challenge I gladly accept. I mean, we're not going to talk about some of the colleges that have been looking at you. We won't do that. We won't make the Spartan fans get all nervous. But <laughs> thanks for being a part of the community. Hey, man, you get your kids scholarships, too, for the people who want to go on. I mean... Don't have enough time to talk about that, but you've got 12 seniors, correct, yep. who are going to have scholarships? Yeah, 12 seniors um, that uh, they earned it. The short story is when we first got there, I told them, hey, um, you know, uh, how many players make it to college? I had a slideshow, said how many players make it to college. In high school, you know, parents, kids were all throwing out different numbers. Um, they're saying 3%, 7%, 10%, 1%. I just told them the next slide was it doesn't matter. You know, statistics take care of themselves. It's just my job to push you guys to aspiration. And right. those so young you men win, defy statistics. My bad, Ben. So no, when you win fine. your first conference championship as a head coach at a Division One program, we'll come back and do this again. Here's one thing I wanted to make sure that I didn't forget to ask. You go on the desmet.org website, right? There's no bio for you. Here's what there is a description of M-A-A-D men. So let's yep. retrace my steps. Go to the DeSmet website. There's nothing about Coach Steeples. There's nothing about your accomplishments. There's nothing about your journey and how you got to where you were. But there is a couple paragraphs about M-A-A-D, mad, men. I think that speaks volumes. Why don't you tell people a little bit more about what that means? Yeah, Madman it stands for Mindset, Accountability, Action, and Discipline. Um, for us, um, after my first year, um, we were thinking about, like, what things should we focus on with our kids? And so every year, most football teams come up with a cute slogan each season. But just because you come with a new slogan doesn't mean you mastered it that year. Like, if our slogan was all in uh, last year and we go win a championship, does that mean we mastered the art of being all in? No. And so I said, I want to have a clearly defined and consistent uh, standard that these young men could follow um, that could lead them to success. And so the goal each year is to be more and more madmen. And so mindset, that's being mentally tough, being focused, accountability, that's being bought into the team, team standard. Action is a huge one for our kids. Don't just talk about it or tweet about it, but uh, put action behind your aspirations. Your actions should match your aspirations. And then discipline you know, just being consistent uh, in your execution and intentional in your development. And we feel if you have those four qualities, you are a man. This could say mad woman, this could say mad adult, this could say mad man. And uh, a man and our adult or a woman is a person that's ready to lead. We always say an adult is a person that's ready to lead, whether that's a leader of your house, a leader of a team, and at minimum, a leader of yourself. But if you're mentally tough, you're accountable, you're about action and you're disciplined, you're ready to lead. And we say the men part is leading through meaningful relationships. And so every year we strive to do that. We get helmet stickers for it. Um, we give awards for it, but it's like becoming more of it. 
Um, it's gotten to the point now where we had to uh, get it trademarked because a couple of Big Ten schools tried to steal it hmm. and put they had it on their wallpaper. So um, they had to get that cease and desist. But um, there's something that the kids built, and I want that to be attached to them. Um, and that's kind of the blueprint for success. But the best part is they don't have to be robots. You, you, you meet those standards, but you do it while being yourself. Um, you use your God-given gifts. Uh, to reach those standards. And, uh, you know, the goal is to squeeze every ounce of ability out of, leave nothing on the table. And that's squeeze every ounce of ability out of the group and out of the team. And so uh, that's what Mad Men has become. And those young men continue to make it what it is. And as far as, um, you know, my bio, uh, you know, I don't live through the kids, but I live for them. And so um, I just want to see them have their fun. I had mine. Like I said, I'm a foodie. Um, you know, you eat something so good, you want somebody else to have a taste. Football's been good to me. So I just want to make sure they, they clean the plate, leave nothing on the table. We will leave no brats in a blanket on the plate. Yes, no brats in a blanket, man. <laughs> hey, good luck back-to-back, man. You have a good time? Everything good with this? You good? Yeah, yeah. All right. Enjoyed it. All right, no problem, man. Thank you for having me. Uh, appreciate it. It's been a long time coming. Uh I try to stay out of the limelight, but I think, David, you're awesome. So um, I definitely appreciate you having me on. Again, when you win the national championship 20 years from now, we'll reflect back on this. Uh, we will. All right, I got one question for you before we go. Uh-oh. All right, I'll put you on. Uh, best football player in the Smith football history. You got Maneer Prince, Deron Neal, uh, Jordan Johnson, Makai Wingo. I guess Wingo? Tommy Corwin, I guess. Wingo. Matt Steeples? No, 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 I'm not in that list. Uh, I'm guessing I Wingo. Was, Wingo? I, I would have to. No, we've had Coach that. Grower on before. Here's my question back to you Greatest basketball Spartan of all time? Well, if you ask in rec league, of course it's Robert Steeples, but no, um, <laughs> I think, um, I mean, people, you know, they're going to say Steepo. Um, I'm sure he did some dominant things. You know, I was very impressed with um, with um, Ahern. Mm hmm. Um, I mean, we have Mike Kalikak. He was really good. Uh, you know, the 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 favorite one to talk about that that never really came to fruition is Jared Leonard. It was well, a Von Scales. Best. Yo, Von Scales was great too. Um, but uh, I can't say I'm uh, knowledgeable enough to pick a best without sounding like a casual. Um, but uh, Ahern always impressed me. Uh, Steepo, Nolan Berry, Von Scales. Those are guys that stand out. And and, and Jared Leonard. Uh, what could have been so um, th those are the players that stand out to me well and here's the thing man you're going to do a lot of other th how old are you you're like 32 31 31 so cut a year off uh yeah. you got the program back it was acclaimed for a long time to again I, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus hey stuff happens it just it lost its its lure and you brought it back yeah, I mean, it, I would say uh, we brought it back, but yeah, definitely had to stand in front of it, take the punches that were necessary. Um, I think, uh, you know, uh, I might not have been the Smith's first choice initially in interview uh, before the interview process, but, um, you know, once I got to meet with leadership and we got to sit down, they could see we aligned and, uh, you know, we didn't know what I was getting myself into, um, but uh, you know, one thing I knew is I was going to surround myself with people that were willing to work just as hard to get through it. And I would say uh, whatever we did have, we used to the fullest and whatever we've lacked, we've created. And so that's a testament to the people I got around me. Um, to, <laughs> and coach, know, here's the other thing too. So I'm a Mizzou fan, right? Mm -hmm. Mizzou, Kansas, in Arrowhead, Kansas, number one, Missouri is whatever. Mizzou wins, right? Show yeah. me, showdown. That's a discussion ender. Whenever I get in a conversation with somebody from Kansas, how many championships they've won, how many big wins they've had, I just get to go Arrowhead. Yeah. Same thing with the Smet. Anytime yeah. a CBC guy is trying to give uh, the Smet grad some problems, the Smet guy just gets to go uh, ESPN. Conversation's yeah, over. I mean, that makes the game. I mean, one thing I made sure I didn't do was downplay the significance of that. You know, you try to treat it like it's another game and it's like the hell with that. It's ESPN, man. You know, like when's the like you get to play on national TV, enjoy every minute of it. And so 
uh, to see that moment not be too big for them and understand that there's going to be plenty of battles between us two from here on out. But at the same time, that game, you know, you can't get that back. And um, I think it's an added, uh, um, I guess, level of impressiveness to it because it was done on a national scale with all the pressure and, and no, you know, prior um, victories in, in the recent history. So, uh, yeah, I, I think both teams realize that going in, like no matter what happens in that rivalry, that's going to be a pivotal um, moment in it regardless. And so I'm just glad we came out on top. But, I mean, those kids stepped up, man. Um, uh, they stepped up, and, and it's still one of the more memorable games uh, for me. I enjoyed the encore. We kind of stopped and then we got yeah. towards the end. So that was good. Yeah. You, you, that I mean, that's a, a testament to you as a host. You asked the good questions, man. You know <laughs> how to get it, some out of them. We'll do a seven. All right, man.